All right, Micah chapter 5, beginning in verse 10, the Bible reads, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots, and I will cut off the cities of thy land, and throw down all thy strongholds. And I will cut off, witch, uh, I will cut off witchcrafts out of thy hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images also would I cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee. And thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands, and I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee. So will I destroy thy cities, and I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. Now we're going to focus there on the verse 15 where, talk, where the Bible reads, I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. Before we get into the message, I want to kind of take a minute to just really look at that word fury and define it. So if you would just bookmark Micah uh, chapter 5 there and turn back to Genesis chapter 27 very quickly. Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27, I'll be getting in, reading in verse 41. And Esau hated Jacob because of the bless, blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are, are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. Verse 42. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she sent and called Jacob her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau is touching thee, doth comfort himself, proposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, and arise. Flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and tarry with him a few days, until thy brother's fury turn away, until thy brother's angry turn away from thee, anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him. Then will I send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? So we see here that Esau in this story is, is uh, experiencing great fury. And that fury is something that stems from anger. He's angry about what Jacob uh, had done to him. Um, and deceiving his father and, and taking the, the, uh, the birthright and the blessing from him. And he says that he's going to slay his brother. He's so angry in this passage that he's gone so far to say, I'm going to kill my own brother. He's going to kill his own flesh and blood. And his mother, of course, warns Jacob and he flees. And she says in her, in her warning him in verse 44, Until thy brother's fury turn away, until thy brother's anger turn away from thee. Now we would think when we read that anger and fury are the same thing, and in a way they kind of are, but I believe that fury is, a, is an expression of anger. That anger is something in and out of, of itself. That you can be angry with, with somebody, but not necessarily be furious. That a, anger is something that results in fury, if, if I can say that. You see, because fury is, is a taking out of that anger. It's an expression of that anger. It's possible to be angry with somebody, but not express that in the form of being furious. Now, Fury is taking vengeance in a very specific manner. As we see here, you know, Esau's intent was to slay his brother. He wanted to kill him. He was so angry that he became become furious that it resulted in the action of him actually desiring to murder or kill his own brother to slay him. So we see that fury is, is, is taking vengeance upon somebody. It's a intense and extremely fierce emotion. It's something that we, it would be defined as a violent or destructive rage. You know, if we were to come in here, you know, Brother Nick, if you were to come in this morning in a, in a, in a, in a fury, in a, in a violent and intense rage, maybe you would have thrown the door open and just start kicking chairs and, and making all kinds of noise, right? That way we would say, boy, he's furious this morning, right? We, we talked about uh, uh, Jehu last week and how he drove his chariot furiously. What was he doing when he was driving that chariot? He was going to take vengeance. He's going to execute wrath and judgment. He was driving furiously. So we see that fury is an intense and extremely fierce violent and destructive rage. Now, furious vengeance is something that God carries out. Fury is something that God experiences. It's something that God um, does. He has a fury. He has vengeance. He has anger. And that's really what I want to talk about this morning. Because if you're there in Micah 5.10, it says in verse 15, And I, the Lord speaking, I will execute vengeance and anger and fury. So God is saying that one day... And he has in the past, and we know in stories in the Bible, but even in the future, that God is going to execute vengeance in anger and in fury. Meaning God, that God one day is going to execute a, a fierce and destructive, violent rage upon the face of the earth. That God is not just a God of, of uh, sunshine and flowers and puppy dogs and rainbows. God is good, we know that, and we'll talk about that, but we have to also understand that God has another, uh, there's a, a bigger picture to the nature of God, and part of the nature or the character of God is that He is one who executes furious vengeance and anger. Amen. 
And that's the title of the sermon this morning, The Fury of God. The Fury of God. Now you say, that sounds scary. And it is. And that's really something we're going to talk about here. Because we're, we, of course, we're in the month of October. And this is when everybody wants to celebrate all the, the fear and, 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 and being afraid of things. And the ghoulish things. And all these things that, are, that would give children nightmares, you know. And, and all these kinds of things. And our culture treats fear or being afraid as a ch type of cheap uh, entertainment. Yeah. Being afraid of something or experiencing fear is just a cheap form of entertainment for many people today. Yeah. And they don't have the proper respect of what it means to be afraid of something. You know, I think, of course, as we walk around today, if we were to go to Walmart or any of the big, you know, uh, stores where they're, where they're selling lots of goods, they would have all their Halloween decorations out. And they would have a lot of ghoulish things. I know that our, our apartment complex, they, they always make a big deal out of Halloween. It's the one holiday that they they celebrate. You know, they, they, they shut down the parking lot and they have all the kids come with, to do the trick-or-treating. And they've got, you know, the spider webs and the giant spider and they've got this ghoulish, you know, witch. I mean, I'm walking out the other night to go get my, my soda pop. And I say soda pop because that way I can appease everybody, soda and pop. And so I'm walking out to get my soda pop and I come around to the pool where it is and there's this, and it's dark out, and there's this this fake witch standing about this tall, green face, long chin, the nose, the hat, this ghoulish looking witch. And I mean, I'm about ready to draw on her, you know. I'm, walking, I'm, in, I'm in South Phoenix, and I don't even be seeing that, you know. But I remember just walking about it, and even as a grown man, it gave me chills for a moment, you know. And it was, it was kind of like, man, what, and, and this is something that they want children to see. This is something that they want people to, to, to look at and to feel that fear. So we see that, that, that fear, that being afraid of something is just cheap entertainment today. And we could think of all the horror films. I mean, we could sit here and just list hundreds and hundreds of horror films that have been put out, you know, over and over again. They're even remaking these, 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 these horror films, these ghoulish films that depict some of the most gruesome and violent acts against, even against children. You know, I haven't seen it, but I've heard a lot of people rail on this new movie, It, this remake of, of Stephen King's movie, where it's literally just this psychotic killer clown that is preying upon children. I mean, what a, what a demonic yes. thing. Yeah. What a demonic thing that people would want to even go see that. Right. I mean, what's wrong with your heart and your head if you think that's something you, you should go look at? Yeah, right. That you want to go and you want to feel that experience of fear from someone depicting violence against children. Yeah. It's sick and disgusting. Exactly. We could even think in even more, maybe of a more, you know, uh, less abrasive way that people are seeking to have fear and are, experience that fear and that, that, uh, that thrill that comes with being afraid would just be these thrill seekers, you know, daredevils, people that are just taking foolish risks. Maybe they're not necessarily trying to, you know, uh, watch things that they shouldn't watch or, or uh, you know, decorate things with ghoulish, you know, ghouls and goblins, but they're doing things that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, I think number one would be, you know, these guys on motorcycles. I see them every day on the highway just, you know, go flying by. I mean, I'm driving on a, on a surface street the other day where it's 45, and I kid you not, this guy flew by me, and I had him been doing 80 on one, of these, on one of these little bikes, would zip it by. And as soon I noticed, as soon as he got out ahead of me, his head turned around like that, and sure enough, about five seconds later, a police went, went by on, on a bike, too, and I thought to myself, get him. You know, I mean, that guy, I mean, when you're doing 60 or 80 on a surface street, that's like, that's not a ticket, that's go to jail time. You know, but why would somebody do that? Why would somebody take a risk, risk their life so much on a motorcycle? And why would somebody want to do that? Because it's a cheap thrill. You know, people like that, ex that, that, that uh, to be exhilarated. You know, and they, and they do all kinds of things. I mean, we think with the parachuting and the bungee jumping, and it goes on and on today. I mean, if you can, you can go on YouTube and watch people just do the craziest things. I mean, you see all these kids over in Russia that are just doing like this free climbing, and they're going up these, these uh, unroped, climbing up cranes and buildings that are under construction, or, or going and hanging off some high precipice, you know, just dangling by one hand over a drop that's hundreds and hundreds of feet just to kind of show off and you know they get that 15 seconds of fame on, on YouTube not even 15 minutes just 15 seconds they're just some blip in a compilation of some guy doing some crazy thing but why is that people do that why well, I, I can't help but wonder why I mean is your life that boring is your life that dull that you have to go do 80 miles an hour down the freeway on a, on a, on a and, and you know I don't know how many people I've seen or heard of getting hurt or even killed on these motorcycles. Right. I mean, I've driven by them where we, there's some mangled bike on the side of the highway, and you know there's some pair of sneakers sticking sticking out from underneath the sheet on the highway because some guy got killed because some guy just wanted to experience some cheap thrill that he just wanted to feel that fear rise up in himself for a moment. 
and it's terrible. And, and, and you know, I don't want to go on and on about that, but I want us to understand that you know, the point I'm trying to make is that our culture takes fear for granted. It's something that they just think that it's, some, uh, that it's, it's a form of entertainment. You know, it's just some way for them to get their kicks, to be afraid of something. And it makes light of, of and, ignore, and ignores a very important aspect of God's nature. And that, that God is, is someone to be feared. In 1 Chronicles 16, I'll read it to you. It says in verse 25, For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. And anyone who's read their Bible or heard any Bible preaching would know that I could spend the next probably the few hours just reading all the verses where it says, Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. The Lord is to be feared. Yeah. And go on and on about how we are to fear God. And that's why I want to preach about this because we're living in a culture today that makes light of fear. And I think they make light of, the, of a, a very important aspect of God, the nature of God, and that, that He is something to be feared. Now it said there in 1 Chronicles that He is to be feared above all gods. I Meaning God is to be feared. And we live in a culture today, and in a world today, that wants to fear anyone and everything but God. Yeah. See, it says there, it says he is, to, he is to be feared above all gods. And people want to be afraid of everything else. Romans chapter 3, verse 10, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of, the pe of peace they have not known. And how does it end there? And there is no fear of God before their eyes. And that's the world we're living in today. That's the type of nation we're living in today. It's not a nation that doesn't experience fear. No, we live in a nation that wants to know fear. They're afraid of many things. They're afraid of the economy crashing. They're afraid of North Korea nuking you know, somebody on the West Coast. They're afraid of you know, some pestilence taking over our land. They're afraid of the bird flu or the swine flu or whatever the next flu that's going to come out. And we're living in a fear-mongering culture. And we're living in a culture that is entertained by fear today. But notice there it says in verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. It's not enough to just be afraid. It's, you need to be afraid of the right thing. Yeah. And what we need to be afraid today, and what we are not afraid today in this country, is God. Who is probably the most terrifying thing you know, that we could even think of if we really thought about it. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at the, why we should even be afraid, afraid of God. We have to understand, first of all, why, why are we preaching this? Because we are living in the midst of a nation that has no fear of God before their eyes. And we need to put the fear of God before some people's eyes today. And we need to understand, help people to understand that God is somebody that is greatly to be feared. And that fear is not just some you know, trigger for you to get some adrenaline dump in your system and feel some kind of a thrill. It's something that should strike terror into our hearts and motivate us to live for God. You see, we're living in a nation that doesn't know fear. That by, they, if they, this chapter here, or this uh, passage in Romans 3, is a perfect description of our nation today. Romans 3, verse 10, if you're there, it says that there is none that they, that they do not understand. And that's the nation we're living in today. We're living in a nation today that does not understand. They can't even figure out what bathroom to go in anymore. They can't even figure out the difference between a man and a woman. I don't know how many different genders they define. They've come up with all these crazy ideas. They don't understand the Bible. They don't understand even the most simple concepts of, of a male and female. They don't understand. They, have, they, they don't seek God. That's why they don't have an understanding. If we had people today that would seek God and seek His Word, there's no part of our life, there's no aspect of our life that we can't have, re, uh, receive in wisdom and knowledge understanding from God. Why don't they understand? Because they don't seek God. And that's the nation we're living in. You know, and there's, we seek God and we say, well, no, we seek God. And we, we sing, God bless America, America the beautiful, God shed his grace on thee. And we'll have these anthems and we'll have these moments of, in the nation where everybody just stops and pauses for a moment to acknowledge God. They'll never say Jesus Christ. They'll never say claim the God of the Bible. Just say God in this kind of general sense. But when do they do that? They always do that after some tragedy. They do it after the Las Vegas shooting. They do it after 9-11. They do it after some massacre has taken place where everyone actually feels the type of fear that maybe they should have been feeling all along. Yeah. And they pause for a moment to acknowledge God, to kind of tip their hat and say, oh, by the way, God bless us. God take care of us. God comfort us now that we're, we're afraid of something. But that they don't seek God. 
You know, I'm thinking about, I think about these guys, these football players are, are, are taking a knee and how everyone's just this outrage, outrage over these guys that are taking a knee. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, this whole nation needs to, to forget about a knee. Everyone should just get on their face. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look what our nation is at today. And it's, it's terrible. And everyone wants to get upset because of, you know, they feel like they're, their, their race is being oppressed. You know, they've got some multi-millionaire out there, you know, talking about how oppressed everybody is, right? I'm not entirely sure what the whole thing is about, but I, I think it's just ridiculous. That, that's what everybody's up in arms about. The NFL. The protests in the NFL. Let them take a knee. I don't care. I don't watch that stuff anyway. It doesn't matter to me. I would like to see the whole nation, you know, get humble and bow down before something that matters, like God, that they would seek God. That's what we need to do. You know, when they don't understand, when they don't seek God, that's when we go out of the way. And that's what we see going on in our country. We see people who, are, who don't have no understanding because they don't seek God, and then they're gone out of the way. They're lost in the woods. I mean, if God's Word is a light and a lamp unto our feet and a, guide, and, a, and a guide unto our path, to guide us through life, and if we ignore it, is it any wonder that, that we would become lost in the woods, that we would just lose our way, that we would be gone out of the way? Our nation is, is one that does not understand. It is one that does not seek God. It is one that has gone out of the way. And it is one that is unprofitable to God. I believe that there probably was a time in this nation where we were sending out many missionaries to go out into, into distant lands and, and other parts of the country to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's very few and far between today. And even the ones that we are you know, sending out, they're doing such a poor job at it that it's a nation that's become unprofitable to God. There's no profit to God. Why would God want to even want to keep us around? It's of no use. Our nation does, is, if anything, is contrary to God and is, 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 uh, is taking away from the work of God. And it's hindering the work of God. <clears throat> it's a, dis, a nation that is deceitful. This is the nation we're living in today. And probably if you could say this about most nations in the world, they would fall into these categories. It's a nation that is deceitful, that is using lies and deceit to, to prosper. It's a nation that is swift to shed blood. Right. Ain't that the truth? I mean, we've got abortion clinics all across this land yep. that are shedding innocent blood every day of the week. Thousands and thousands and thousands of unborn children slaughtered in our land every day. It's swift to shed blood. Not to mention the wars of aggression that we do. Right. And we, you know, so many Baptists want to get up and hoorah and wave the flag and pledge allegiance to the flag and get very patriotic about America. But let me, let me tell you something. Our, our, our armed forces are over there shedding innocent blood. Amen. And you can like that or lump it. That's the fact. We got people over there that, you know, they're just bombing innocent women and civilians. And, and that's what's happening today. That is a, that is a fact. So we are living in a nation that is swift to shed blood. And they do not know peace, as it says here. They do not know peace. Is there any peace to our land? Look how many people are fretting. Look, at me, look, at, look how many people are just pumping themselves with all kinds of drugs just to calm their nerves. Yeah. Just, to, just to get themselves to go to sleep at night. They have, the, just, they, they have no peace. And why is it? Why is that? I believe it's there in verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We've made light of the, of the fear of God. We've wandered out of the way. We don't seek God. They don't understand. They have no fear of God. And this should concern us because there's consequences. There's consequences when a person does not fear God. It's not just like, well, I've chosen to ignore God. I've tried, chosen to just uh, not, not seek Him and go out of the way and, and to just not have any fear of God before my eyes, and that's it. You know, and, and we just suffer the consequences that come along with making such a decision. God is proactive in, in, in punishing people who would not fear Him. And if you don't believe me, turn over to Leviticus chapter 26. And we'll look at that. Because this is an important dynamic that people need to understand. That there's consequences for not fearing God. More than just the natural consequences that come in and of themselves. You know, that if we don't fear God and we don't live by His commandments, you know, the, the ramifications of sin are going to be a form of punishment. They need to understand that this there's this dynamic that God is going to proactively work against you if you don't fear God. Leviticus 26, let me get over there myself. Leviticus chapter 26. We'll begin reading in Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 13. I am the Lord that brought you, I am the Lord your God which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that you should not... Uh, that you should not be their bondmen, and I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright. But if you will not hearken unto me, and, I'll, and will not do all these commandments, 
and if you should despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. So God is proactively going to do something to them. If they disobey God, if they have no fear of God before their, their eyes, if they don't seek God, if they, if they don't have any respect for His commandments, He says, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague, and shall consume the eyes, and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. So God just takes it to the next level. He starts out with this, this, this chastisement. And when that, that's not enough, God says, you know what, I'm just going to even bring it up a notch. He's not just going to throw up his hands and say, well, look, it's just, just, that's just the way they're going to be. No, he's going to continue to go after them. And if you will not yet hearken for all this, in verse 18, unto me, then I will punish you for your, your, your punish you seven times more for your sins. Verse 19, and I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if you walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. So God takes it up the next level. If they still don't get it right, He takes it up again. Verse 22. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, and destroy your cattle, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you seven time, yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring the, a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And he goes on there. So we see here this concept, this dynamic, this principle in the Word of God that there are that the results of not fearing God, that not taking heed to God, that not respecting His commandments, that it's is that God is proactively going to come against you. It's, you know, we, as we read there, He said, "I'm going to do this to you. I will do this. I will walk contrary to you." And that ought to be a very sobering thought to us today because we're living in a country that is contrary to the Word of God, that has decided to go against the Word of God. And God's not just going to sit back and just act like nothing's going to happen. God is going to proactively, and I believe already is to some degree, beginning to chasten this country and turn us over unto our own way. Now, the fury of God is the result of man's disobedience. That's really what we're seeing here. It wasn't just God was like, hey, I'm bored. I'm going to torture you. God isn't just some kid with a magnifying glass out there, you know, frying ants. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. Hopefully no from PETA's listening, all right? You know, like, who's ever done that? Anyone ever done that? Yeah, okay. You know, God's not that. God's not just, you know, trying to get some cheap kicks. God is doing this, bringing these judgments upon them. He's being contrary to man because man has been contrary to him. And that's what we need to understand. And people have an imbalanced view of God today. They don't want to acknowledge or understand this aspect of God's nature. They ignore it. Or they'll just deny it. They'll ignore or deny God's vengeful nature. God has a vengeful nature. And they'll say, well, God is love. And turn over to 1 John chapter 4. They'll say, well, God is love. And that's true. God is love. I mean, that's what the Bible says. You can't deny it. But you also can't ignore the many, 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 many other passages that's, that, that show us that God is not just love. And we need, they need to understand what that even means when God says that He is love. And we're going to look at that here. Because that's what you'll hear a lot today. Well, you know, just... Just love everybody. Just be at peace, and you know, don't judge anyone. Just, just love everybody, and it's just really nice, warm and fuzzy feeling. And they think that's just the way God is. Like God is just some, you know, half wit up in heaven. Just some, just some father up there who doesn't really know what's going on. You know, his kids are running amok in the house, but he's just some senile old man who doesn't really. He's just happy go lucky, some sappy old man who just doesn't get it. You know, God is love, but God is also a vengeful God. He's a righteous and holy God that judges. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. Verse 8, He that knoweth not, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, 
for God is love. Now those last four words of verse 8 are, 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 again, not a sign of a sappy, oblivious God. That's not what it says. It first of all, it doesn't say God is only love. It just right. says that God is love, right? Meaning that there's more than one thing that God is. Now, now consider the verses that continue on in this passage. Look, what does that mean when he says God is love? Well, he goes on to explain it. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world. So what is the love of God? How do we know what it means when it says God is love? It's because God sent His only begotten Son into the world. That's, what, that's how we know that God is love. That we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us. And sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is why God is love. Because God sent His Son into the world to be the propitiation for our sins. Now that word propitiation, that means a, like a, a substitutionary atoning sacrifice. It, it, it specifically, if you look it up, it means to appease a holy or righteous God. If you're going to make a propitiation, it means you're going to substitute something to appease a holy God. That's what a propitiation is. So, yes, God is love, but God is love in the sense that He sent His Son into the world. And what did Jesus do when He was here? He suffered torture and shame and death and even hell. Right. That's the love of God. It's not that just God is just going to turn a blind eye and just turn the other way and ignore sin. It's that He came and punished His own Son for that sin. Yeah. He made a propitiation for our sins. You see, the love of God is not Him just looking the other way. The love of God is, is, is appeasing Him through the righteousness of Christ. That's the love of God. And thank God for that, that we who are sinful, who have no hope without God in this world, have a propitiation through Jesus Christ. That is the greatest love any man can know. For you know, God commendeth His love toward us. Commendeth, meaning He lifted us up and, and says it is greater than any other love you could know on this earth. My love towards you. But that love is expressed through the death and burial of His Son. <laughs> now if you would, turn to Isaiah chapter 53. And we'll look at this. Because people need to get this in their heads that when they say God is love, they need to understand why God is love. It's because Jesus Christ died for their sins. Because a holy and righteous God laid our sins upon His Son. <clears throat> Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of, dry, of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire. Now this is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. This is who this, this passage is speaking of. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So that's the love of God, that God would come and be bruised, that come, God would come and take our transgressions upon himself, and that he would be chastised and smitten of God. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep dumb before his shears, before his shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. So we see here from this passage about Jesus Christ, that we understand that yes, God is love in the sense that he poured out his righteous indignation on his own son. That's the love of God. The love of God is not just him ignoring the sinful and wicked uh, nature of man. It's him dealing with it. Now, the dismiss dismissing God's holy nature you know, leads to a people without fear. When we have people who don't want to understand God is love in the proper context, and they don't want to understand that God is righteous and holy and vengeful, 
and then he, you know, he'll execute vengeance and fury upon man. That leads to a people that have no fear. They don't fear God. And nothing can be more frightening in this world, I believe, than, than seeing and experiencing the wrath and vengeance of God poured out. You know, we're, we here at Faith Word, we believe in the, in the uh, post-trib, pre-wrath rapture. You know, and we know that we're going to be taken out before God begins to pour out His vials of wrath upon this earth. And thank God, because that is going to be a time on earth like no other. When man, I mean, you want to talk about a horror. You want to talk about literal a hell on earth. God is going to open up the literal, you know, gate to hell. He's going to open it up, and there's going to be animals. You know, the, the locusts are going to come up out of hell and torture man. That's scary. That's God. That's what He's going to do. And thank God that we're not going to be here for that. But we know, and we're not to have a spirit of fear, but we have to exercise that and understand that we're not going to have any part in that. But leading up to that, those three and a half years, I believe we'll begin to see those birth pangs. We're going to be able to, we're going to begin to see, you know, God allowing wicked and evil men to wax worse and worse and to, and, and to see things start to happen in our world that could be quite frightening. But we have to understand that whatever man can do, whatever, whatever fear man wants to put in our hearts, God is far more exceedingly fearful. And God wants to, but God still wants His people to understand that He will judge. That is something that people need to understand today about God, that they need to recognize about the God of the Bible. And if you're going to claim the name of Jesus Christ, and if you're going to lay claim to believing the Word of God, you have to acknowledge the fact that God is a holy, righteous God who will judge the earth. And that's why there's so much Scripture describing it. Let me read to you from Nehemiah chapter 1. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. God is jealous. The Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Goes on and says in verse 6, Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. Verse 8, with, with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. That's God. That's, the, I mean, that's God today. People say, well, that's Old Testament. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, right. today, and forever. Amen. That's the God of the Bible. And you know, if, people say, well, that's Old Testament. Have you ever read Revelation? That's, a, that's far scarier than anything you read in the Old Testament. Yeah. That's where God is at his most vengeful is in the end of the New Testament. Yeah. If you would turn to Isaiah chapter 34, if you're still there in Isaiah, Isaiah 34, beginning in verse 1. Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34, verse 1, the Bible reads, Come near, ye nations, to hear and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all these things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and His fury upon their, all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them, and He hath delivered them to the slaughter. You see, people want to say, well, not America. God bless America. You know, we're not going to experience any of that. Well, let me tell you something. I think the children of Israel probably thought the same thing. I mean, if anybody had any, any reason to lay claim as God's people, or why they should be spared from God's vengeance, you would think it would be them. I mean, those, they were the ones that had the oracles of Christ given to them. They were the ones that had Moses deliver them. They were the ones that were given the law and the commandments directly. But let me tell you, we would not be the first nation to suffer the, the fury of God's vengeance. We wouldn't. We just read about Nineveh. There's many other nations. I mean, the prophets in the Old Testament, just it's nation after nation after nation that God is just proclaiming judgment upon it. In Ezekiel 5.11, Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord, Surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thy abominations, therefore I will also diminish thee. Neither shall any man my eyes spare, neither will I have any pity. And he goes on and he says here in, uh, in verse 15, Astonishment unto the nations that are round about thee, when I shall execute judgments in thee in anger and in, furious, in fury and in furious rebukes, I the Lord have spoken it. So another example of God that He's going to execute judgment in a nation. That He's going to do it with fury and in furious rebukes. And He says, I the Lord have spoken it. Jeremiah 21, I'll read to you verse, beginning of verse 3. Then Jeremiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say to Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, 
Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, wherewith ye fight against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans, which besiege you without the walls, and I will assemble them into the midst of the city. And I myself will fight against you with an outstretched arm and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. And I will smite the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of a great pestilence. So that's God pronouncing judgments on Jerusalem itself, the city of David, you know, the city of the great king. That's where God is, is pronouncing wrath. And he's even saying, I myself will fight against you. You know, it's one thing when a nation begins to fall apart within and just devour itself within. When a city or a nation just begins to just eat itself apart, just pick itself apart amongst themselves. It's another thing when God decides, I'm going to fight against you. When God is, is going to, to go against you himself. And we would not be the first nation as Israel. They probably might have came to a shock to them. But we, you know, have we not, you know, done all these great works and these wonderful things and, and, and say oh, we have the, the you know, the the temple and the sacrifices and the priesthood and, the, and what a great glorious city. You know, they, they would pay lip service to God. And that's the nation we live in today. We live in a nation that wants to pay lip service to God. Yeah. You know, they want to sing the anthems. They want to sing the ballads. They want to wave the flags. And they want to just invoke the name of God. But all they're doing is they're paying in lip service. And if they were serious about acknowledging the God of the Bible, there would be things that we'd be getting right in our land. We wouldn't see the homos running rampant, doing whatever they want. We wouldn't see the abortion. We wouldn't right, see right. The innocent blood being shed. We wouldn't see people just committing adultery and fornication in every turn. We wouldn't see all the smut and filth in the media. We wouldn't see all the lies. I mean, this nation is turned against God. It has nothing to do with the commandments of God, but they want to pay lip service. Are you still there in Isaiah chapter 29? Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. Wherefore the Lord saith, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. So God's saying here that there's a people that, you know, they're drawing nigh with their mouth, but their hearts are far away. And that's exactly what we see going on in our own country. But notice there he says that their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Meaning that people aren't getting the, the fear of God and understanding of what it means to fear God for themselves. They're going to a man and allowing him to teach them what the fear of God is. And pastors today, that's what they're teaching their men. They're, they're, they're teaching people the fear of God as the precept of men. And what they teach is that, you know, the United States can do no evil. You know, it's your best life now. God is not angry with you. You know, you have nothing to worry about. God wants you to prosper and have money and, and just show up once a week and put your tithe in the offering plate and everything's going to be fine. That's what we see today. As we see at these, 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 these liberal churches, these mega churches, these community center churches where, where it's just come as you are, leave as you came. And it's just, you know, you come in the same, you leave the same. And you're, you're just going to hear about the grace. And, you know, you're going to hear 1 John, you know, 1 John 4, the, you know, God is love. You're going to hear that verse many, many times. But they're never going to turn to Isaiah. They're never going to turn to, you know, Ezekiel or Jeremiah or any of the prophets for that matter that are just pronouncing. I mean, you read the prophets, name a prophet who didn't pronounce the judgment of God on somebody. Right. I mean, that was their whole point. Yeah. That's why God sent them to pronounce judgment. And yet we have people today standing up and saying, not having anything to do. They resemble the prophets of old at, in no way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. they, they don't look anything like them. But it's all just love, love, love. That's what it's all about when you go to these churches today. And they teach the fear of God, and you hear this a lot. Well, fear just means respect. We just respect God. You know, I have, I have respect to exactly. I have respect to my boss. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I, to a certain degree, I fear him. Because, you know, he could, he could have serious repercussions on my life. You know, if he decided he got in a bad mood one day, or I did something wrong, or I, I, I did, you know, made a big enough mistake, I'd probably lose my job. Right. What puts me, so it's not just respect. It's not just that I say good morning when I walk in, and have, have a good look on my face, and try not to... You know, have a bad attitude. It's not no. I, 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 I that, you know, that's that's good to have that respect. But there's a level of fear. And that's just a man. That's just a man on earth. Think how much more God that we should fear God. But pastors today, they just teach that you know the United States can do no do no evil. You know, they'll acknowledge things like all oh, the abortion's bad, and we ought to work to have legislation against it, and this and that. They won't call it what it is. They won't stand up and say, yeah, you're a murderer. Right. You know, if you go down there and have your unborn child. You know, torn out of your womb, you're a murderer. Yep. Or that doctor is a murderer. Amen. That they should, yeah, they should outlaw abortion. 
Yeah, they should outlaw abortion, and then they should round up all these doctors yeah. and execute them. Yeah. yeah. That's that's how you avenge innocent blood on a land. And if you don't do that, innocent blood, it's a stain upon the land. Yeah. And God doesn't forget it. He keeps track and he tallies it up. And God is gonna is marking it down. And he's going to execute vengeance and wrath because of that innocent, innocent blood. You have to appease a righteous and holy God by avenging innocent blood. That's how we would treat. That's how it would be treated. It wouldn't just be let's go stand out there with a sign. It would be you know we're gonna do. There would be some serious consequences for having done it. Now, if you would turn to Second Peter chapter two. So we see that to the problem today is that people have no fear of God. They don't want to acknowledge the furious vengeance. Of God, they don't want to acknowledge that God is one who executes vengeance and furious wrath upon the earth. That God is one who is vengeful, and they're taught that by the precepts of men. They're taught the fear of God as something other than uh, than what it is. That there's nothing to worry about, and that we're okay here, and that you know all these things that we've done. Yeah, it's too bad, but you know God is very gracious and long suffering, and that's true. But they have to have an understanding that there's a point to which God. You know, he, he draws a line in the sand. There's only so much he'll stand. And these people that teach this, they're, you know, that, that God is just this, you know, just as not to be feared, that they don't, they teach the fear of God by, by the precepts of men. They remind me of these guys in 2 Peter 2, verse 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness are reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, words of vanity, word, I mean, words that have no meaning, they're empty. They're hollow words. There's no depth. There's no power. They're just swelling words. They just puff you up. They swell you up. They make you feel good. They allure through the lust of the flesh through much wantonness. They say, oh, you can drink. You can be a drunk. You can get divorced. You can commit a fornication. It doesn't matter. God understands. God knows. That's what these people are like that teach the fear of God by the precepts of men. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. So they had promised them liberty. And is that what we see today? We see people, that's what a lot of these preachers and these pastors out in these churches today, that's what they do. They promise liberty. Oh, you're, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You know, Romans 8, man. Romans 8, 1. And you think this is, I'm making all this up? I've seen it. I remember before I got, you know, locked into a good Baptist church, I went to a, a kind of an ecumenical like, you know, like youth Bible study in these people's house. And there was this guy, this girl that came, and she, you know, she showed up just all immodest. And we'd all you know, play the guitar and wave our hands, and then we'd talk about the Bible a little bit, and then go play Uno or something. But sure enough, it wasn't long, a few weeks into it, you know, they're holding hands. Then they're dating. Then you see them out in public, just, and they're just carrying on. I remember, and I remember confronting this guy about it, like, don't you know that's a sin? And he said, well, I talked to my pastor about it. And he said, it's okay for me to fornicate because there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. Yeah, to them who walk in the Spirit and not after the flesh, right, there is no right, condemnation. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we know that we're free in Christ, you know, that we have liberty in Christ that in the sense that we don't have to worry about going to hell when we die, that we re receive the free gift of salvation, that we become God's child. But if you, even as a child of God, are to go out and walk in the flesh, there's condemnation. There is judgment that will come. And that's a whole other sermon. But that's what we see today. That's why there is no fear of God before people's eyes today. Because they have men that are standing them up and promising them liberty when they themselves are the servants of corruption. And people need to be taught that God can become furious in vengeance. And that's the point of the sermon today. To show you from the scriptures and help you to understand that the God who we serve, the God of this Bible is a God who can become furious in vengeance. And it's a frightening and, and sobering truth, and it's unpopular. But it's something that needs to be taught and understood. It's something that we need men to get up behind the pulpits and just thunder forth across this whole land that God is holy, that God is righteous, and that God will execute vengeance in wrath. That God is not just some you know, half-wit in heaven who's just going to look the other way. That God is keeping track and that God will repay. That vengeance is His. Right. Hebrews 10 says, I'll read for you in verse 30. For we know Him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge His people. It is a fearful thing 
to fall into the hands of the living God. And people today, they want to be afraid. They want to experience fear. They want to feel that, that rush, that adrenaline of when they parachute. They want to feel that, that chill run up their spine when they go to the, the, the movie theater and watch some wicked, ungodly horror film. They want to and, and, you know, put fearful and, and, and frightening thoughts into the children and the, and the heads of, of children by showing them ghoul, ghouls and, 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 and images that are just demonic on you know, every house and, and every store through Halloween. And they need to understand something. That that's, you know, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You want to be afraid of something? Ponder falling into the hands of the living yeah, God. That's right. If you are there, if you could turn to Matthew chapter 25. Now, if we're going to, if we want to, if I want to, if there's people out there that want to be afraid, they want to fear something. I, let's talk about probably the most fearful moment in all of existence. I mean, if there was one moment you could say, where, where, where is the one place and one time when people are going to be more afraid than they've ever been in their life. I mean, if the goal is to scare somebody today, to feel that cheap thrill of fear, let's go ahead and talk about probably the most frightening thing that will ever happen. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all His holy angels with Him, then he shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Verse 41. Then shall he say to them on his left, on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Yes, friend, God is love. But it says there that the everlasting fire that God is going to condemn people to was something that was prepared. Meaning God created it. That hell is something that God devised in His own mind as a way to execute vengeance and wrath upon His enemies. It says it's prepared for the devils and His angels. And when man fell, man now ha get, ha it has, a, has to take part in that vengeance and wrath. That's frightening. That's a sobering thought. That's why it says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of living God. You see, those who treat fear as entertainment, they need to consider the reality of the great throne judgment. That one day God is going to, to judge this entire world. And that there are going to be those that are told, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. That's frightening. Revelation chapter 20, we're almost done. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. We'll see more about this fearful moment in time called the great white throne. Let the thrill seeker, let those who want to have the cheap thrill of fear, take note of the most fearful time in all of existence. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the, is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now this scene here is frightening. And I believe that we're all going to behold this scene. And it's sobering. But consider what's taking place here. This isn't just people going to hell. This is when death and hell are cast in the lake of fire. This takes place after the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. The end of the millennium. Meaning people that are dying now, they're going to hell. But at the great white throne, they'll be resurrected. They'll stand before God. They'll be judged according to things written in the books. And then they'll be cast in what's called the lake of fire. Prepared for the devil and angels. So you, imagine if you're one of these lost people. Imagine you're one of these people that rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. Decided not to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Decided not to accept the free gift of salvation, but rejected it your whole life. And one day you die. Maybe you were that thrill seeker you know, on some motorcycle. And you were the one that went out for cheap kicks. And you got in a wreck and you died. And you found yourself, you woke up in hell. And you're there. Let's say you're, you, this happened right before the millennial reign. Something like that. You're there for a minimum of a thousand years in hell. A place of, of fire and heat and, 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 and torture and torment. 
It's a terrible place to be. It's frightening. And then after a thousand years, all of a sudden you're resurrected. And you have a moment of relief. You have a moment where you're standing before the great right throne of God. And you're there with everybody. The small the, and the great, the dead, all that have existed. What a scene that will be when we see all that have ever lived gathered before the great white throne. And you're there and you have that moment of relief. And then it starts to dawn on you what's happening as you see person after person cast. And it says cast, meaning it wasn't just said, it. God said, you know, go to your room. And they, they trot it off. I think that they will have to be taken and drugged, kicking and screaming and cast in the lake of fire. That they're going to be thrown against their will in the lake of fire. I mean, would you want to go there? That's what's going to happen. They have that moment of relief and they stand before a holy God and they realize they're guilty. They're judged by the things that are written in the book. And they see these others that are beginning, that are being cast in like a fire and they begin to understand your fate. Can you imagine the fear that would set in on somebody at that point? And it wouldn't just be some cheap thrill. It wouldn't just be you taking in some horror film. It wouldn't be something that you could walk out an hour and a half and go back to your life. It'd be something that you're facing down, that it's going to happen to you. What a fear that would be. What a fear that would sink into that person's heart. And then finally they're cast in the lake of fire forever, never to escape again. That's the God that we serve. That's the God of the Bible. That's a God who executes vengeance and fury and wrath upon sinful man. And people don't like to hear that. It's a hard and sobering truth. Now thank God that's not going to happen to us that are saved. Those of us that have, said, that have recognized that Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. That He died for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Right. So those of us that have that truth, what is it that we should do? You know, it's sobering to think about that we know those that might go to that, that might take place in that scene one day. Maybe we'll be there. Maybe we'll see somebody that we know being cast in the lake of fire that we didn't bother to tell. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'll read for you, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We need, a, we need to come to terms with this. We need to let this sink in. Not just people that are saved and just look they're, I mean they're just like dumb dumb sheep they're just cattle they're ignorant they don't know they need to be warned they need to be told those of us who understand the, the vengeance and the fury of God we ought to, we, those of us who know as it says there in verse 11 the terror of the Lord that have, have come to, to terms with this sobering truth of the great white throne we need to go out and we need to persuade men that's why we go so winning yeah. it's not so we can raise our hand and report a number it's so that we can spare somebody from that fear Amen. of going out and, or, or standing before God knowing they're about to be cast in the lake of fire. That they won't have to know that fear. They won't have to know that terror. That's why we go. That's the motivation. That's why we need to do it. And that's what we need churches in America to do today. Yeah. That, it's not so that we can you know, pat ourselves on the back and feel good about ourselves. It's because people, that's, that's the heart of God. That's what God wants. Do you think God enjoys casting people in the lake of fire? I don't think He takes some kind of sick pleasure in it. But it's something that a holy and righteous God must do. That He will execute vengeance throughout. Because people need to understand that God is not somebody be, to be trifled with. That He's holy, that He's righteous, and that He does judge, and that He does execute wrath and judgment and vengeance. And He does it in fury. That is the fury of God. So now that we understand that, you know, let that sink down in our hearts and, our, and, our, and, our, and let's go out and let's persuade men. Now, if we need to, as the Bible says, you know, saving some with fear. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Don't be afraid to tell that person at the door, hey, you're on your way to hell. I hope you know that. I hope you come, you know, if they reject the gospel, kindly and gently remind them, but firmly. You know, the Bible says, if you reject Christ, that you're going to have your part in the lake with burning fire and brimstone. And people will scoff and mock at that until that day comes. So let's go out and let's, let's just persuade men because we understand the terror and the fury of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for, Lord, even these hard truths, Lord, that we can, Lord, we could sit back and we could cower from them, we could ignore them, we could uh, try to explain them away. But Lord, I believe that you've given us these truths so that we would be motivated, that we would be moved with compassion to go out and, and, and do all that we can to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you that 
You've made salvation free, that you've made it simple, that you've made it easy to simply put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we can go out and we can trade and we can tell people about the, the true love of God, that there is a God who loves them so much that He came and took their place, that He suffered all those things willingly, Lord, of His own will, to come here and, 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 and make that atonement for us. Help us to carry that truth to others, Lord, that we might see them spared from that, that day of vengeance. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.